Okay, C++11 introduced new ways of initializing values, but it, it's always been quite tricky how values are initialized in, in C++. But we need to start a little bit earlier than that. C++ is called a strong typed language. It means that every symbol at every given point in time during the execution of the program has a, has a type associated to it. Either it is a function, it is a variable, it has a type associated with it. Some languages don't have this constraint. You can write x equal hello and soon after x equal 10. People regard this as a good feature. I think it's the idiot, it's really dangerous and horrible. But you know, people like it. But it's intrinsically slow. Basically, every time I need to, to look at x, I don't know what type it is. I need to query some, some runtime system information. I need to go to an hash map or something. Say, I have, a, have x. What is the type and what is the value of this guy? C++ doesn't do it. If you have a symbol, the symbol is created with a type. And when it's destroyed, it's destroyed with a type. And then in another scope, you can redefine the same symbol with a different type, but you cannot have the same symbol in the same scope with different types. The type can be deduced using auto, that C++ feature that I guess everyone has heard about. But that, that doesn't, that doesn't um, make C++ known type safe. The auto is just a shortcut to say, OK, I don't want to specify the type of this variable. Uh, find it out. Give me the type. You cannot change it after, all, after that point. In C++, there are different types of types. There are the fundamental types, which are like integer, float, doubles, char, even void and null pointer. Everybody knows what null pointer is. Null pointer is C++ equivalent of a null pointer. As is what it says, what it says. You should always use null underscore null pointer if you want to pass null pointers around. It has many advantages. First of all, you can, you can check. You can specialize your functions for null pointers. So you, if something is null, you do something special on it. And it's a, it is a uniform way of treating null pointers. So no more zeros passing around functions, just null pointers. So there are the fundamental types. And there are the compound types. The compound types are types that are made of other things, like references. Why reference is a compound type? Because it's a type plus the symbol, the um, percent, right? And we have all value and R value references in C++. You have pointers is a compound type, pointers to members, like point, pointer to data members, a pointer to function members. Arrays, functions enumerations, classes, and unions. Those are the compound types. And almost all of them can be qualified as const or volatile. These are all the, all the C++ concepts. Const means the value cannot be changed. And volatile, is a, this can be changed by anyone, anytime. Even from someone that is not running on my, uh, in my code. Maybe a sensor out there. Another classification of the types, instead of being fundamental, the compound, it can be you have objects. And basically everything, every variable you have in your program is basically an object except for references, functions, and, the, and void. Everything else is an object. Okay? Very clear. Everything is an object except for references. There are scalar types, which are the arithmetic types, uh, the pointers and the enumerations. There are trivial types, which are POD, aggregators, leaders, and scalars, also scalars. You know what the POD stands for? It's a plain old data type 
We will go into this. It's very interesting what you can do with displaying all data types in C11 and aggregators especially. Then there is also another category of types, which is the incomplete types. It's a type that cannot be used. It's not finished yet. There's something missing. You need to put some, some information there to get the final value. Um, we, we, we will find a couple of examples of incomplete types. All these uh, classes of types and kind of types, it's difficult to find the right word here. Um, many of them can be checked at compile time. You can ask if a certain type is, a, is an integral type, or if it is a POD type, and there are more. We will see more on these along the course. It's a nice way to check during compilation that something's happening, that what the type of some object. But we have to go into templates first. But type traits and these type classes are basic, uh, sometimes referred as concepts. And con it has something to do with, with, with the concept. So if you have, a, uh, if, if you have a, an integral type, it's a concept of an integral type, so it has certain guarantees for you. You can run uh, a plus operation, minus comparison, stuff like this. The main problem is that all these objects that you have around must be initialized to something. You cannot just create an object and leave it there without any, uh, any values. There are invariants that the object must contain, etc. So C11 introduces a new way of initializing the object. Uh, it is the, you can usually, to initialize an object, you use the uh, round parentheses. In C++, you can do it with the curly braces. And this sometimes is kind of confusing to people. They say, well, wh why sh should I use one or should I use the other? The answer is more complex than it, than it looks like. So if you have a class there, struct A, that has a constructor that takes two values, an integer and a float. And now, I, I, I didn't put the implementation there, but then you can go into your main and you can create an object of type A, or you can create X, and you can call with the parentheses 42, 3.14, and Y, you can do the same, but with the curly braces. So what's the, who knows what the difference is between these two? They're exactly the same. For this particular case, exactly the same behavior. You can use curly braces, you can run parentheses, we we'll just call the constructor with two, with two values in there. Now, let's go a little bit deeper. What happens when I instantiate this one? Sorry, we did that? It's a function declaration. Yes, it's a function declaration. So if you write this one, you know the struct A now has a default constructor, so it should be called without arguments. If you call this guy, you get a compile error to say, saying something like the fun you cannot find implementation of a function or something. Very, very confusing, but because this is seen by the compiler as a function called X, that return a type A that doesn't take any argument. And it's a function declaration. Instead, this guy with the curly braces actually works because there is no ambiguity here. Right? You cannot call a function with the curly braces. You can only call construction, you can only construct the object. So this actually works. This is called the default constructor of A. What this guy do? Come on, the same, the same constructor. In this case, in case of a class, this guy and this guy are exactly the same thing. Okay. So 
So if I have a, a function there in the main as to, which has a, which declare a vector of integer v. Okay, that is a wrong code, but suppose I have only the first line. What does that guy do? It's the shade, as we saw before, vector is a class. So it, it, we call the default constructor of the vector and we'll do whatever it has to do. We create basically an empty vector. What is the second line doing, apart from the fact that it has the same name as the one before? What is the difference between these two sentences? Exactly. This, this, require, this allocate the integer on the stack. Also, the vector is allocated on the stack. The data members are the, are the vectors allocated on the stack. This allocates this other integer on the stack. But it doesn't perform any initialization of it. The, the right way of saying is that this, it's not that integer cannot be constructed. It's that it is not initialized in this case. So in this case, V will be basically be undeterminate. It will have the value that is in the stack before you enter that function. So the default initialization, like in this case, is when you don't put anything. You don't put curly braces, you don't put, uh, well, parentheses you cannot put, you cannot not, not put the curly braces, you don't put anything there, you don't put any initializer. That is the default initialization of an object. There is another thing, which is the value initialization, is when you, when you use the empty curly, brace, empty curly braces and the empty parentheses to initialize an object. And what does it do? It calls a default constructor. In case of an integer, it will initialize, it will perform the zero initialization, okay? Uh, arithmetic types, so even float and doubles, float, doubles, yes, and uh, chars and others will perform the zero initialization. So you can write E into Z, open and curly, open and close curly brace, and that will initialize to zero. The rule is that it takes an integer zero and cast it to the type, whatever type it is. So this, in case of fundamental type, is a zero initialization. So you know after that that Z will be zero. So already we are seeing a couple of differences. So you put the empty curly braces, you call the default constructor if it is a class. If you have an integer or some other fundamental type, you just initialize to zero. In case of, uh, uh, of an array of chars, it will put zero on the, re on the remaining entries there. So you're not surprised by the outcome of that operation. And also static variables will be zero initialized. If you create a variable A, as a static in the global scope, it will be initialized to zero at some point. And we'll see tomorrow when. Um, now, what is a POD? Plain old data type. Is a, is a class, is a struct, or struct or a class. You know, class and struct are the same thing, only that access control is different. Uh, but basically, a POD is a class in which all the data members are PODs themselves. It's a recursive definition. There are no members of this data, of this class, that is, that are references. There are no virtual functions, no user-defined constructor, or member initializers. We will see the member initializers soon. The same access control for all data members. So they're all public, they're all private, and they're all protected or an array of PODs. Does this make sense to anyone? Anyone confused by this? Please tell, because things are getting worse. <laughs> okay, a POD is a class. which has to say, okay, so all private int a float b char c all 
all the data, all the data members of this class are private, so they have the same access control. If I put public, it's still a POD. They're all public data members. They, they are not references, so I cannot have here a reference to something. I don't have constru uh, constructors, only the automatic constructor. This is the rule of zero. Okay? The compiler generates the, con the, the, the constructors for me. Uh, no virtuals, no constructors, same access, and also it has to derive from, I think it has to derive from PODs if it has, I don't remember exactly the rule. I will look it up if you, if you need that. But this is it, this is a POD, plain old data type. Almost all languages provide something like this. This is why it's called plain old data type. Pascal had it, Fortran had it, right? Everything, every language has a bunch of values packed together some, some way. It's not a POD, exactly, yeah. And the idea is that if I put some public as some, some private, the automatic con constructor can get a little confused. It's not, basically the semantics is not clear anymore. So here you know what, you're, what you are supposed to have. Okay. A POD is a super class of an, another, oh yeah. No, no, the struct and class are the same thing. The only difference is that the class, as by default, the data members are private, and the struct, by default, data members are public. There's no difference between struct and classes in C++, apart from this detail. So, struct is a POD? Yes, absolutely. The difference between a class and a struct if I do class A int A, and I do a struct B int A, the difference between these two guys is that I can get this thing out as a public data member. So if I do B, B in my, I instantiate an object X of type E, and then I do X dot A, this will work. If I do it with A, this is a compiler error, because A is a, is a private data member. So a class with a public and everything public is basically struct, indistinguishable from the other. Okay, other question, please. Okay. Aggregate has a special cases of PLDs. Not only they have the same access control mechanism, all public, all private, all protected. They have to be public. And it's the other thing, no constructors, no virtual methods, no references. They have to be public. And the aggregates can be instantiated in a special way, which is called the aggregate initializations, also known as struct initialization, in which the data members are initialized one by one in the order of appearance in the definition of the class. So I have a struct short array underscore three, which has a, an array of three elements of integers. A short array of five, which has a data, uh, fi uh, which has an, uh, an, an array of five integers. And I want two arrays to have like a, a data member is a short array of three, and a data member is a short array of five, another one is an integer. Basically now I have, this is an, aggregate because it doesn't have constructors. Everything is public because it's a struct. And uh, this is data members of this one are also aggregate. So the recursive things 
kicks in here. And then I can instantiate these array, two arrays writing this syntax. So the first data member is an array of three integers initialized by three to one. The second data member is an array of five integers initialized like this. And the final integer is 324. Okay, this is the this initialization is fast. It doesn't call any function. It will just the compiler insert the code for putting the values in there. And allows you to do const expression and compile time evaluation. This is the first compile time thing we see in this uh, in this course. I can put a const expert. We will have a long uh, description of this const expert uh, keyword. You can basically say two arrays. I, I want to instantiate a two, ar a two arrays object. I call it two with these values here. But I wanted it to be const expert. So it will be constructed at compile time. So at compile time, I can simply do a static assert say check at compile time, static assert means check at compile time, the 2.x is equal to 324, and this code compiles. If it doesn't compile, it means this value is not right, or this is not available at compile time. Clear? Why do you want to do this? Why, why, why do you want to do these things here? Well, it's quite useful sometimes. Let me see if I have it. Yeah. You want to, for instance, have your for loops to have static bounds, or bounds to be known at compile time. As, a, as, as, it's a, as it is widely known, if you have a for loop which goes from zero to n, and n is a variable, the compiler can do some optimizations, but maybe not as much as if you knew the value of n at co during compilation. A loop from 0 to 100 is intrinsically more efficient than a loop from 0 to n, where n would be specified at runtime. So it might be useful to have these things uh, known at compile time, and the compiler can figure out. So for instance, std array, which is a data structure available in the standard library, is an aggregate. And you can create an array of unsigned of length three, and you call it bounds, and it's three, four, and five. And now you can check at compile time that the bounds are actually what you wanted. And now you can pass that guy to some function. If he knows the thing is a compile time, you can, the compiler can do optimizations for you. If it's not known at compile time, then you simply instantiate the array during runtime. So you don't put the const expr in front, it will become a runtime variable, and everything works again. Only that will be less optimized. Questions? Yep? Okay, so the question is standard vector, I repeat for the video recording. The standard vector is not a POD, but it has the braces initialization. The difference, we will see soon what it is, that, that the vector has the initializer list constructor. So the vector as, the, as, as, a, um, as a class as basically a pointer to some heap allocated storage plus size information and a few, and few other things. Um, so it cannot be constructed at compile time because it needs to allocate the memory. But still the syntax can be very similar to this one. Okay, so you can still use the curly braces to initialize it. And this is considered a feature, but it is confusing. So it's not constructed at compile time. Never. Uh, you can also notice there that the two curly braces there, it is because the std array has a data member, which is an array of things. So it's a data member, which is already an aggregate. So you say, I'm instantiating an aggregate. 
the data member is also an aggregate, so it could again other curly braces. This was considered annoying and is going to be removed. I think maybe C14 already removed, but for sure C17 we removed this so you can write with a single single curly brace uh, through brace elision, but you can have brace elision when you do the assignment. Okay, if I do three, four, five, and assign it to bounds, then I can do it. It, it, it. it will work and will initialize the thing correctly. Let's go deeper. The initializer list constructor. This is a mechanism in producing C11 to introduce the curly braces initialization syntax And uh, here we have a code, okay? We have a class X. Let's go with the class X, which has uh, as a data member as the vector of chars, and as a constructor of X that takes an initializer list of ch uh, the called chars, and I can simply call V chars and initialize my vector with that initializer list. So I can write x, x, and hello, or I can do y equal and initializer list. You can see here there's no double curly braces because it is list initialization, so it's not aggregate initialization. Now, if I call f, yes, if I call like this, f, h, uh, hello, and I, and I use this function call here, I get the compilation error because that function up there, which is a template, doesn't, doesn't know how to convert this guy into something. It doesn't know what it is. So if I put initializer list of chart and I put my values here, then I can go into that function and do for each and then go from the begin to the end of my list and print it out. Is everything clear in this code? Uh, should I have a couple of examples? I mean, examples that might be interesting. Let's see. Uh, in terms of performance, list initialization is a copy operation. So you need to copy element by element. Can it be list initialization be moved? I don't think so because the data structure is different. So you need to do the copy. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult from the implementation point of view to make it efficient. So it's basically a copy element by element. So it's not efficient. But you, never, you usually don't use list initializers for very, very long sequences because you have to type it in, right? So it's, very, it's just for to initialize the initial set of values. Uh, the aggregate initialization is a totally different beast in some sense, and which looks exactly as the other one, but, it, but it's not. And it's uh, very confusing. Uh, I find it quite confusing. Let me see if I can find this example. Uh, what? Ah. ah, I was uh, planning to show you how to do the checkout of the code, and I didn't, so git. Let's get a code. I don't have the code yet. Okay. Make the year. Build. All right. Uh, values. No, what is that? Type and values.
Where is it? Static variables, candidate, generic, candidate. Ah, types and values there. I'll read back to the example. Here it is. Can everyone see this? Yes. So I have a function test there, which is a template. It takes the sequence type in input. And I want to generate a sequence with, a, with some values in there. So I call auto x generate sequence type. And I call that template function there, which generate takes no argument and return a type v constructed with the brace initializer. Yeah, but I hate pointers, but I guess I know I have no chances here. Yeah. So here, you take the type the v as a template argument. Everybody familiar with this, right? We we will go into template later on and gory details, but this is the basics. So we should be able to read this code. So it's a template function takes the template the the v type and returns a v. One, two, three, four, five, and it's, it's returning auto. This is C plus plus fourteen code. This generate this guy called the sequence type, and I call test with the vector of integer or with an array of integer of size five. What happens here is that this code works. Only that when I call with the vector. The vector get passed to the generate. This is the v will be std vector of integers and will be list initialized. When I pass an array of int, this will be this will go here. This v will become an array of integers and this will be aggregate initialized. All right. So, but the fact that I can use the same syntax here. It's called uniform initialization. And it's one of the achievements, let's say, of C11 standard. But you, know, you need to know what's happening. So the code works, only that the performance of this code is not that easy to understand because, of course, now this has become a copy operation for the case of the vector and becomes compiler putting numbers there in case of, uh, of STD array. Yeah. Would it be smart enough to do that, or would it by default create an object? No, I think it will be smart. It will be smart. It will create a const expert. If you, if you, if you mark this function as const expert, it will generate a, com a compile time, this guy, but this has to be const expert too. So the auto would not figure out, I could maybe use a const expression. No, auto doesn't infer const expert. Yeah. It doesn't decide what Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Const is part of the type trace, but const text is not. Okay. <laughs> Interesting? Okay. Okay. Now, the problem is that we see that the, the <laughs> The code, we can use curly braces, we can use round parentheses, and say, why, wh when should I use one and why should I use the other? And the question becomes round definitions versus curly construction. They wanted to have DD versus CC in some way, and they, then they figured out a way of doing it. And so I say that these the curly braces are for aggregates, is the only way to initialize and aggregate efficiently is to use the curly braces, otherwise you go to the construction. Well, the compiler can be smart enough in many cases, but. Otherwise, curly braces and round parentheses will just work 
as every other constructor will work. The compiler will look through overload resolution, <laughs> will try to find which constructor to call, and then call that constructor. Except that a little trick. So who knows what these two lines are doing? Yep. Exactly. So the first one is a constructor takes, create a vector of 10 elements initialized to four. The second one is creating a vector of two elements. The first is 10 and the second is four. Why? Because the list initializer will always take precedence on the others. So little bit of a trick here. You have to know how, what is the interface of your class before you actually know what happens. Uh, and this is also why designing good interfaces is so fundamental, because you might get in really weird troubles here if you, at some point, deep down in your program, you figure out your array has only two elements. I said, you get really puzzled. Let's go into mental models a little bit. There's something which is called copy initialization. So we are seeing default initialization, value initialization, and aggregate initialization. Looks like a mess, and in many ways kind of it is. But there is another thing that's quite useful, is the copy initialization. The copy initialization happens when you write something like type x equals some expression. The expression is evaluated, and the conversion constructor is selected through overload resolution, basically saying, okay, whatever this guy is giving me back, I'm trying to construct x with that guy. But also, when I pass an argument by value to a function, if I pass, if I call a foo of five, of five, five will be copied into the local variable of the function, remember the stack, Right, it will be put on the stack somewhere, that value, and then it will be used. That is a copy operation. Also, the copy happens when returning from a function. Even though there, many times, the compiler is smart enough to do an optimization which is called copy elision. If I do x equal function of something that returns a type, something of a that type, Basically, the trick is that the compiler put <laughs> the return value on the stack. Let's say that we have a function. We have a type T, okay? We have a x a equal foo. And we have a function foo somewhere that returns a x. Okay, now what happens is that you should call the function by putting the argument on the stack or something. Instead, the, the compiler can say, well, since I have this very straightforward relation, I can simply give A the address on, on my stack. So it will have the his stack with A, and then we'll call the function X, and the, func and the return will basically construct the object directly into where A is happening. And this is called a copy elision. And it's an optimization which happens very often. If it doesn't happen, it's tricky to get it off. But this is the copy elision. Here comes the idea that if I have a struct B, I have an, uh, with the data member integer, and I do int x and I, to construct my my value, A inside my class, if I do B, uh, if I instantiate an object B and equal 40, what happens is that, okay, this is an integer, let's try to find a constructor that takes an integer to convert my integer into B. It's basically the conversion operation. Yeah? Uh, I need to look it up. Okay. 
I will, I will go back to you. Yeah. I don't have it on the top of my head now. I know there is a thing, this thing for this guarantee copy lesion, but I was confused when I first looked at it and don't remember it. Um, so these will work. This will call, like, convert, try to convert this integer into a type B. If I use the explicit keyword on my constructor, this doesn't happen anymore. I have to explicitly cast it, so I can do like this. I can take B, can create an object of type B with static casting to B of a value 10, which will call the constructor which takes an integer. The explicit keyword is useful to control what the user can do with your classes. Right? If you want the user to be more concerned or more careful when it does a certain operations, you can use the explicit keyword to help it out a little. In this case, for instance, this, this code works. You have a B, we instantiate B with a float, and this will work because the 10, the, this is a 10 dot, this is a double, will be, it will search for, through overload resolution. What is the constructors that can work? Well, okay, there is a one that's happening an integer, and it's the closest one that I can find. So I can take my double, I convert it to an integer, and construct my object. If I do like this, well, similar thing, that it goes and look for integer, for, for, for a constructor who takes two, two arguments, if it doesn't find an initializer list constructor. And this guy will also work because of this operator int return a. This is the conversion operator. Everyone have seen this one earlier? That you can define conversion operators to convert one object into some other object. And this code will work. If I put explicit keywords everywhere, like all the constructor and also the conversion operator, then I have to return A explicitly. Now, when I do make B here, I can just return this guy and will be automatically casted to, this, to B. It will construct B with those arguments. Otherwise, I have to be explicit and say I want to construct A. I cannot do assignment. I can only do direct initialization here. This is called direct initialization, just to add another type of initialization in C++. This is called, now I cannot do assignment here, I can just call the constructor similarly. And here I can only do static cast integer because this is explicit conversion, so I have to know, I have to say I want to convert this to an integer. And this is kind of safe net because maybe I didn't want to write this one and then you know I get into trouble. Okay. Let's go with some tests. We have 10 minutes, then we go after lunch, I guess. So this guy, what does this guy do? It depends. It, it depends. No, it doesn't depend. Hmm? Oh, no, this is in, in main, sorry. You're right. Yeah, I didn't think about it. So this is this instruction into some function. OK, yeah, good catch. So it isn't some function and doing this, what is happening? It's initialized to undeterminate value. Whatever is in the, on the stack will be on the stack, and whatever it is, it is. This one, now it should be easy, zero. This guy. Come on, what happens? Default constructor. This, well, make it quick, the same. Default constructor. You see the difference here, right? This is non-initialized, zero-initialized, basically the same guy here, same thing here. What is code doing? We will go into deleted functions later on, but what is this guy doing? 
When I put a delete on a constructor or any function, I will say to the compiler, I don't want this function to be called. So what should happen here, in principle? Compiler error. But what is this guy doing? And this is scary because this actually initialized the guy as an aggregate. Which is kind of puzzling for, to me, actually, because this guy deleted constructors are assumed to be there, but not be called. So if it is there, it is the default constructor, so it's kind of borderline, but it shouldn't be an aggregate because it has a constructor, even if it's not called. But this, this code works. This, this will compile and initialize B as an aggregate. What happens here? Nothing surprising, really. Overload resolution finds a function, which is a constructor. It takes an integer, but it is defaulted to 10, so I don't have to pass it. Call the guy, and we'll have value 10 as, as first argument. This guy, exactly the same. This is called the overload resolution. We will go into this later on. And basically saying, well, find a function that matches, whatever matches. If it finds something, we'll call it. This is an aggregate, right? So no surprises there. If I do like this, what happens? You remember? Actually, you find a constructor and call it with 000. But not always, <laughs> fine. So it, it called the automatic default constructor. Uh, no, actually, you're right, no. It doesn't guarantee you to be set to zero. So default constructor becomes zero initialization. So it becomes initialization of the data members, which are integers, so we'll not be, they will, be, they will have random values. We, we can double check later, I'm pretty sure it is. You know, this thing can get so complicated that I don't want to scare you off, but you need to know and at least understand that there might be issues simply initializing a value in your program, and you can get in trouble. This one is a compiler error, as we post pointed out earlier, and this one is a, this one actually is a struct initialization. So this guy will go and initialize to zero all the data members. I should look at my slides before talking. Here, C of 10, we'll call this constructor. C of 10, we call this constructor. Oh, no, sorry. This is list. OK. <laughs> Tricked. This guy will call this constructor. This guy will call the list initializer constructor. And similar here, like the example with the vector we had before. OK. I think we have it. Oh, yeah. In case in which we don't have the list initializer constructor, this is just constructing with a one or two arguments. OK, five minutes, yeah, OK. C++11 introduces the concept of member initializer. In C++ 3 or 98, if you have a struct with two data members and you want to initialize those values by default to something, you have to construct a default constructor that set the values to, for instance, 10 and 22. Now in C++11, you can simply write this guy, a int a equal 10 and b equal 22. When you construct an object of type a, it will have 10 and 22 inside. Basically, the automatic constructor generated by the compiler will, do the, will be more than simply doing nothing. So the question is now, what is this code doing? Okay, this show 
is a is a is a little helper that I developed in my example in in the examples that we have, uh, which basically print what is showing. It will show x a equal something. So it helps you looking at the code nicely. So when I do show a dot x x dot a, I will see x, the value of x dot a. So if I do x equal 34, and if I do x y, what happens here? It's easier than it looks. You got it. It's right. <laughs> it's a compilation error here, because I don't have a constructor that takes a single integer. But this one works. And a will be 10, and b will be 22. Very, very simple, actually. So now I want to do, OK, I want to create this constructor here so this, this line of code works. Now what happens? What happens is that this guy doesn't work. Because a constructor, I define the constructor, and by default, the compiler will say, I'm not doing any, any default construction here because I'm too scared of what, of what the consequences could be. So this line will work, construct a to 10, sorry, uh, no, a to 34 and b to 22 will behave as expected. But this guy will throw an error because the default constructor is not defined anymore. And this comes back to the automatic construction, uh, the, the automatic uh, constructors that will come up later on more and more. So instead, we can do like this. We can define the default constructor as default. And we let the compiler do whatever it wants to do. And, and then the constructor is a single integer. And this code will work and compile nicely. And will behave as expected, let's say. The a will be 34, b 22. In this case, a 10 and b 22. OK, I think we should go lunch. I think it's good to have a break at this moment. And we go on later. There are any questions so far? Too hard, too difficult? These are the basics, just to get you warm up. It becomes better later, I promise. <laughs>